the fun thing today, David Tassi. <coughs> okay, he's been interested in fossils and prehistoric history since he was eight years old and has accumulated 60 plus years of experience searching for fossils all over North America and Asia. By age 12, as little kids busy, he had discovered three archeological sites that are recorded in the Michigan State Archeological Site Survey. Pretty cool, I'm impressed. In addition to dinosaurs, Latasi, Mr. Latasi, that sounds so rude, doesn't hey. say Latasi. Mm -hmm. Mr. Latasi has studied prehistoric man, ancient world history, and archeology. span while working with the Museum of Science and Industry that we all know as Mosey at Tampa, he led fossil collecting trips to Polk County. So please join me as we welcome David Latassi and his toys. As you can tell from my stance, uh, one of the hazards of collecting fossils over the years is breaking your ankles in the mine. And that's what happened to me. So I kind of stubble around a little bit now. I'm going to stand up for a little while. And uh, when I get a little tired of standing up, I'll sit back down. You got a good shot of me over there? Good. And everybody can hear me very well. Well, first of all, I'd just like to tell you a little bit, a little bit about my background. Um, when I was uh, working in Michigan, I was very interested in the fossils in Michigan and the archaeology. And I decided to uh, go up to the University of Michigan with some friends of mine, and we thought we'd just go into the collections there and see what it was like. And there was this door in the museum that said, no admission. And my buddy and I said, what do you think would happen if we sneaked in there, you know? <laughs> and so I, I said, well, you know, we could get in trouble, but I'm gonna chance it. And so we went back into the lab. It was actually the paleontology lab at the University of Michigan. And a fellow approached us, and I thought, here it comes. We're going to get in trouble. And he said, oh, you want to come in and look at some fossils? And I thought, wow, that's totally awesome. And so we got to meet this gentleman that was in the collections there. And I didn't know who he was at first. And then he finally introduced himself. His, his name was Dr. Claude W. Hibbard from the University of Michigan. And he's one of the most famous paleontologists in eastern North America in the early 20th century. I didn't know it at the time. But the neat thing was is that he treated me just like was, I was an associate. And I was only 11 years old. And he knew I was interested. So just about every six months, my dad would take me up to the University of Michigan, and I'd go see Dr. Hibbard. And he would pull his collections out. He'd be spending all summer in Kansas collecting vertebrate fossils. And when I'd come up there in the fall, he'd say, Dave, you got to check this out. I found this fossil horse, and right underneath it was a skull of a camel. I'm going, wow, this is awesome stuff. So that's kind of got, what kind of got me started. And since my real passion for years has been saber-toothed cats, you can tell by the cat skull that's sitting up here, that I really wanted to collect fossils once I got out of the Navy around the country. Michigan just didn't have enough fossils for me, so I decided to my met my beautiful bride, Susie. Uh, Suzanne is uh, my technical engineer up in the seat here to the right or your left. And uh, you're going to see her dance gently up here and pick things up. And some of the things on the table, we're actually going to pass around my so-called toys. <laughs> and actually, all of the things that you're seeing here up there are actually real fossils. But the saber tooth cat skulls are so rare here in Florida that we use fiberglass castings, resin castings, for lectures because if you passed one of the real ones around, you know, uh, <laughs> that would be unfortunate to drop one of those. And the one saber cat skull that I have here from Florida uh, actually came from a private collection, and it was in about 2,000 fragments. And it took me about, what, 10, 10, 11 years to put it together. So we do have that actual cast in our collections, uh, actual skull from Lysi Shell Pit. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about all of these wonderful sites uh, here in Florida. One of the things uh, with the fossil collecting here in North America, uh, Florida has actually been known for over 150 years for vertebrate fossils and marine fossils. But a lot of the geologists and paleontologists 
in the beginning of the 20th century. They knew they were here, but they didn't know how they fit in with all the fossils they find out west in Western North America. And when you go out collecting in like Nebraska and Wyoming and Utah and South Dakota, the rock layers out there are in these beautiful sedimentary layers, just like a layer cake. And you find the bones sticking out of that clay and rock. And it's very easy to tell the age of those fossils because they're in a sequence. But here in Florida, we don't get that because it's a hodgepodge of clay sediments that have been eroded over time because of the lowering and the raising of the sea levels here in Florida. And the, the hurricanes have mixed things up. So the only way that we can figure out the ages of the fossils here in Florida is we have to put what's called a community of animal fauna together so that we know what the cats are, what the horses are, what the camels are, what the elephants are. And then when we see what those particular species look like, then we can comparative, comparatively compare them to the fossil out west. And it's taken over a century to actually put those together to figure out what's here in Florida. And you can see Florida started out rather strange. And all the time that I've done programs here since we came down here looking for saber-toothed cat fossils in the 1970s, one of those things happens to a person after you started studying something long enough, people start to think you're an expert on it. And after about 25 years of collecting and a little bit of writing, some of the museums start getting interested in my information on fossils. And all of a sudden, I didn't ask for it, but museums started asking me to work for them. And so I started working for museums here in Florida, particularly Great Explorations Museum in St. Petersburg and Museum of Science and Industry in Tampa. So that was kind of my start in the museum business. Other than that, I'd just been collecting for like 30 some years out west or up in Michigan, and finally a little bit in the 1970s here in Florida. But Florida's geology was really bizarre. Kids will always ask me during one of my programs, are there dinosaurs here in Florida? And unfortunately, I have to say, no. Now, there are fossils here in Florida that go back to the age of dinosaurs. But unfortunately, so many sediments have piled up over those fossils of prehistoric animals that lived at the age of dinosaurs. You have to use what's called a well core sample. You have to drill pipes down thousands of feet under the surface of Florida, and you may find fossil layers that go back at least 400 million years here in Florida, but they're about eight to 10 to 12,000 feet below the surface. If you go up to the University of Florida at the Florida Museum of Natural History, you'll be able to see some well core samples of fossils that have been found here in Florida that go back before and during the age of dinosaurs. But the rocks that we find in Florida because Florida was predominantly under the ocean during that prehistoric time over 30 million years ago. So the sediments and the rocks that we find here in Florida are actually around 50 million years old on the surface, under it, just less than 50 million years. And then the first fossils of land animals didn't come into Florida until about 30 million years ago. And I'm gonna show you a series of fossil sites and the people that found these sites and it actually built up this mosaic, this pattern of how we know what our prehistory of Florida was like over the last 50 million years. And you see by this map, the green area or during the early Miocene period, which was about 25 million years ago, we started what we call island Florida. And we did have some islands here. Now that green area that's represented up there, that's a guess. We don't, we don't really know exactly what the island looked like. It might have been patches of islands. It might have been an archipelago. We just don't know because we find bits of fossils here and the bits of fossils there. And it's telling us there were land animals here, but we don't know the size of the land yet. It was still underwater, most of it. Now, when you look at the rock layers in Florida, you get this layer cake effect, which is the same thing that I said about when you look out west and you find fossils out there. But our fossils are kind of jumbled, and so you don't get this beautiful, 
what we call stratigraphy or layering like you do out west. But you do see that, of course, the oldest rocks are on the bottom and the more recent are on the top. You see the skull up there, the human skull. We do find some fossil human skulls here in Florida, and I'll talk about that. But this is the sequence we try to put together to see how the fossils here in Florida fit in this sequence that you see out west. Florida has a unique property, and it's called calcium, uh, calcium rock formations. And our rock formations here, because of the marine deposits that existed over 30 million years ago, actually build up thousands of feet of rock layers that are made of limestone, calcium carbonate. And this rock layer, Susie, I'm going to have you uh, pick up the limestone so they can pass it around. It's this specimen right here. She's going to hold on to it, and you can walk around with it too. And this is what our basement of Florida is composed of, limestone. It has layers in it that are real glass-like that's called chert. And some of the prehistoric people that lived here in Florida would actually go in the sinkholes in the caves here in Florida and look for the chert that's in the limestone and make prehistoric tools. So archaeology has a big part of our prehistory here in Florida. But because of these layers in the limestone, it's almost possible to find fossil bone and fossil evidence of shellfish and marine animals all throughout Florida. In fact, you could dig a hole. We're not going to dig a hole under the museum, are we? The court. What a beautiful building you guys have. That Barto is just a great place to live, I can tell that. And so if you were to dig, like say if somebody dug one of the streets up here and they got down deep enough and hit the limestone, you would find echinoids, you'd find sand dollar-like animals, even right under our own feet. And if you get lucky, sometimes you even hit a mastodon bone or a saber-toothed cat, because Florida is virtually a peninsula of fossils. It's just amazing geology. I, I think we have probably more fossils here in eastern North America than any other state in eastern United States. And then out west, you get massive rock layers out there. Dinosaurs. Did I mention dinosaurs? <laughs> Not here in Florida. But we do have them as, um, near Montgomery, Alabama. They just found a Tyrannosaur a few years ago on the roadside cut on the expressway that goes through Montgomery, Alabama. So we were kind of on the edge. Who knows? Maybe someday they'll find a skeleton that floated out into the ocean and we find it here. But <laughs> You still got to dig down deep enough. That's the problem. So this is one of the first skulls that was found here in Florida. And it was recognized by a paleontologist called Joseph Leedy in the 1880s. Joseph Leedy was probably one of the most famous paleontologists that ever lived in North America. And you've probably heard of uh, Edward Drinker Cope and Marsh, Nathaniel Marsh. Uh, these guys were the two guys that were fighting each other for the bone wars out west, and they, sent, they spent millions of dollars going out west. They lost all their fortunes fighting each other for dinosaur fossils. Well, Joseph Leedy kind of was interested in mammals, and he didn't like what was going on out there, so he kind of stayed out of that fight. And one of the fossils that was brought to him up in Philadelphia was his skull from Ocala. And it's actually one of the first fossils of a saber-toothed cat skull that was ever found here in Florida. And so this was recognized quite early in the 1880s that we did have some significant fossils. At about the same time, just a little bit earlier, they were finding saber cat fossils in La Brea tar pits. And so that led teams like the American Museum of Natural History and the University of California to realize that there were certain types of prehistoric animals that were found in California. And then when Leedy described the saber cat from Florida, wow, Florida has fossils down here that almost are as important as what they were in California. And so Leedy was one of the first to describe this saber cat, and he called it Smilodon floridanus. <laughs> you know, the one from Florida. <laughs> the one in California was Smilodon californicus. You know, everybody's got a name, you know, 
you know how that goes. And so for a long time, this skull was recognized as the Florida saber cat. But over time, scientists revised it, and they now know that the one in California and the one in Florida are the, really the same cat. So unfortunately, they're all called Smilodon fatalis now. So they have, they have a more recent new name. They're, and cats are re revising and doing a lot of research on saber cats right now. I should do a program on saber-toothed cats. So anyway, uh, around 1915, this fellow, Dr. E. H. Sellard, was a distinct, very important doctor. He was a medical doctor that was living in Vero, Vero, Florida. And he was an amateur collector of artifacts, and he loved fossils. And they were starting to dig extinct, extensive canals in Florida to drain the swamps. You know, Florida had a terrible reputation for many generations that, you know, there was malaria, there was sicknesses down here in Florida, everything was mosquitoes. You know, you get bit by an alligator, it was wild and woolly like the old west. We didn't even have fencing laws here in Florida until 1945. So, <laughs> so it was really quite a wild wilderness here in Florida. But Sellards went out to this canal in Vero and he found a human skull mixed with fossil bones of Ice Age animals. And Sellards was convinced that these fossils he was finding were from the Ice Age. And at that time, uh, most of the scientists uh, really didn't believe very much that, uh, that prehistoric people were in North America until about 4,000 years ago. And there was a fellow at the Smithsonian, uh, Dr. Herdlicka, he said, Prehistoric people never entered North America until 4,000 years ago. And because his reputation was so strong, all the other archaeologists cowered in fear and said, yes, Dr. Herdlicka, they only came in 4,000 years ago. And Sellards wrote a paper and said, ah, they were here during the Ice Age. And boy, that didn't go over very well with other archaeologists. But we now reviewed his paper, and his work is solid. And they're actually working archaeology teams out in Vero now, and they're studying this canal area and finding fossil evidence of Ice Age animals in that deposit where the skull was found. So we can't, we'd like to find another human skeleton or bone, but right now we're just finding animal bones at this point. If you want to ask me more about that, there's a famous fossil that was found there of a carving of a mastodon. <laughs> We see a little bit of that with fossil collecting, where people get zealous and kind of uh, embellish things. <laughs> so here we are, 1881, we're still in the 1880s, and they kind of noticed something here in central Florida. Let's see, I think we're up here somewhere, aren't we? Like right in there, Fort Meade and Bartow. And this is like the capital of the phosphate district. Does anybody know what phosphate is? Yeah, probably, you better know if you're living in Bartho, right? Uh, it's really, most of it is composed of detritus. It's actually animal poop, bird rookery material like bird poop. It's uh, potassium phosphate. And when all the animals died in those rock layers, the clay layers here in Florida, their bones decomposed and it left the potassium phosphate. And uh, that material is your phosphate for your industry here, chemical industry, explosives, uh, agriculture, important in agriculture. Uh, has anybody been out to the phosphate man mines and looked for fossils? Anybody find anything interesting? Shark teeth. Shark teeth. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the sharks here in Florida. But of course, they, in the 1880s, they first started recognizing the phosphate here in Florida, it was so overwhelmingly rich for agriculture that there were several papers written on it from some work that was being uh, recognized by, by the U.S. geologists and that the Peace River had extensive uh, evidence of phosphate. And of course, that was really important for agriculture and growing plants. And so by the 1880s, through 1915 was kind of the pioneering period of uh, phosphate industry. And of course, it kind of got the Nomer Bone Valley. 
And the reason for that is by the turn of the century, not this century, the last century, uh, all these piles of phosphate after it rained, the bone would start washing out on the hills. And when the, when the geologists and when the miners walked through these hills here in Bowen Valley, uh, the ravines that were created were like a valley and all this bone was sticking out. So it kind of got that name, Bone Valley. And it's actually now considered a geological formation. And that geological formation here has about three different distinct layers and three different time periods we, we do now know because of the fossil evidence. And the uppermost layer was uh, mostly found uh, uh, not far from Fort Meade. And uh, the, the, the uh, mining of the earliest sites were about 12 million years old. And then there's some that are found about 10 million, 8 million years old. And then the most recent fossils on the top of the deposit here in the phosphate mines are about five and a half million years. And so <clears throat> this area has a very extensive, rich fauna. Susie's going to pass around some fossils from the Bone Valley Formation that I brought today. So we find literally thousands and thousands of shark's teeth. And does anybody know the name of the big guy? Carcharodon megalodon. That's right, the megalodon. And there's a lot of people out there today that just absolutely wish that those things were still alive in our ocean. I'm not one of them. <laughs> a friend of mine, Dr. Gordon Hubble, has a museum up in Gainesville. And he has the world's largest private collection of shark teeth and fossil sharks in North America, if not the world. <clears throat> and he actually has a shark tooth that's over seven and a half inches long. It's just gigantic. And Gordon uh, estimates, and some of the uh, paleontologists up in Gainesville, that it's very likely that these megalodon were roughly 10 feet per inch of tooth. So that, to that shark could have very well been 75, 80 feet or more. And if you go up to Gainesville to the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville, they have actually Dr. Jeremiah's fossil shark's teeth mounted in what the jaws were like. And you can see the bite radius of these teeth. And you could actually pretty much walk through the biggest one, like a megalodon tooth, could actually chew off the front of a school bus. So they were just, you know, that's my talking to kids program. <laughs> so here's what we have here right in our backyard. And what is all this phosphate? Well, we have actually two main deposits that run along the spine of Florida. And the red blotches in the bottom here is what we call soft phosphate. And that's the phosphate that fossils are in in the clay sands here in Florida. And then when you go up into northern Florida, you have what's called hard rock phosphate. Not the hard rock cafe, the hard rock phosphate. <laughs> and the hard rock phosphate was the first phosphate that they started really commercially, commercially digging very extensively. But it's harder to get, more expensive to get out of the mines, it takes more processing. And so after about 1920, the, the industry really shifted more to the south here around Bartow. And so we're really famous for it. Now, here's some of the fossils that have been found in some of these phosphate districts here. This was found by a fellow by the name of Frank Garcia. Has anybody ever heard of Frank Garcia? I know the museum staff had probably had, had been, Frank's probably sneaked here and here. And, now, Frank's a very renowned, well-known fossil collector, and I'll talk more about him during this program. But he did find in the phosphate mines this thing that looks like a giraffe. It has a slingshot nose in the front and two horns in the back of its head. And there's no other animal like it in North America that's ever been discovered. And it's one of the holotype Florida, true only Florida fossils where no other country or state in the world has this particular animal called Kyptoceros amatorum. And Kyptoceros means strange horned beast and amateur collectors found it because Frank was an amateur. And so that's how they named these things. And Gainesville named this one after Frank. Plus he's a fossil collector. And here's your megalodon tooth. And Susie passed those around. I do appreciate if they end up back on the 
Oh, I know you guys will bring them back. <laughs> Boy, the, everybody loves shark teeth. We, our, Susie and I, this was in the 1990s, we actually bought a shark tooth collection and a fossil collection from a noted fossil collector here in Florida. And we donated a lot of it to the University of Florida because there were a lot of new rare specimens, but things they didn't want, we, and shark's teeth, you know, they, they got like a million shark's teeth. And so um, we actually sold the shark's teeth. And the little shark teeth the guy collected, everyone was perfect and pristine like jewelry. They were just gorgeous. And we weren't, weren't sure how many we had, so what we did is we weighed them by the pound. And there were 400 shark's teeth per pound. And we figured the math, there were 32,000 shark's teeth. And he collected that over only a seven year period here in Bartow. So it's just amazing. Why are there so many shark teeth? Do you ever ponder that? Well, sharks have the ability to grow their teeth throughout their lives, and they shed their teeth quite frequently. So really a shark can actually, during its lifespan, shed thousands of teeth. So if you have thousands of teeth, uh, sharks and thousands of teeth per year, all of a sudden you've got millions of shark's teeth in these fossil deposits. So it's not unusual to find sharks almost, especially if you go on the beaches, you know, in central Florida, like around Casper, since near Venice Beach, you go down there and you're guaranteed you're gonna find shark's teeth. If you can get in the phosphate mine, you find them there too, but good luck getting in there anymore. <laughs> it's getting hard because of liability to go in. They really don't like taking collectors out there anymore, which is kind of a sad thing. But things pass. Was that an elephant? <laughs> that just gives you an idea of the massive size of these sharks. That elephant was probably about eight or nine feet tall at the shoulder. So, you know, they, these things were massive. Well, I'm going to sit. My legs are gone. Let me get over there before they fall asleep. And I got to sit just so I can actually see the pictures with you. There we go. Got me in frame yet, guys? All right. So this was the marine environment and the, the coastal areas and the marine deposits here in Florida. Uh, these oceans would rise and fall. And we know that about 30 million years ago to about 20 million years ago, the ocean levels really started rising and then finally lowering. And they became lower and lower until, well, most of the peninsula of Florida was exposed. And the reason that we believe that Florida became a peninsula are two geological processes. One is that North America was moving on plate tectonics into the Pacific Range, and it was actually pushing against the Pacific Plate, the North American Plate. And we're, we're kind of on the remnants of the North American Plate. Now, during the age of Pangaea, I don't know if anybody have ever heard of Pangaea, well, about 250 million years ago, according to geologists, <laughs> I always use disclaimers, um, the, the continents were pretty much all together. And then they started drifting apart, and some of them pushed against each other. And the two continents that, in Pangaea that formed, that came apart, was Africa and North America. And so where Tennessee is at today, actually North Africa was where we're at right now. And the edge of it was in Tennessee. And then north and, and west of Tennessee was the North American plate. And then over time, those plates separated and formed the basin of the Atlantic Ocean. And that's why Florida ended up under the ocean. So that's what formed it in the very beginning. And what rose the, back up as a peninsula is the uplift when North America was bumping into the Pacific plate, one's riding over the other one, and that's forming an uplift, which is actually making North America rise up. And plus, at the same time, Antarctica was drifting towards the South Pole and became polar and cold. And during that early period, glaciers were starting to form in Antarctica. And when you get glacier buildup on a continent, guess what happens to the ocean levels? They start lowering. And that's why we have a peninsula in Florida during the Miocene period. That was a whole cause of it. 
And because North America was cooling down, now the animals were starting to change and adapt, and we started seeing a lot of different animals during that period that entered Florida. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Okay. Now, some of the last of these animals that lived here, like in Bone Valley, were these really strange critters like rhinoceros. We just passed the rhino teeth around. Everybody get a chance to see the rhino? It's hard to imagine that rhinos lived here in Florida, but actually rhinos lived through almost all of the world, from one continent to the other, except Antarctica. We haven't found any in Australia, but otherwise they've been throughout most every other continent. So they're just kind of one of these universal animals. And we had some rhinos that were pretty big here in Florida. But there was one out in uh, Asia that got up to 30 feet tall at the shoulder. Can you imagine that? Bigger than our modern elephants. Who can imagine something that big? But we had here some strange critters like the bear dogs. They were, they were really not living today. They were kind of a prehistoric carnivore that was like, kind of like had teeth like half dog, half bear. And there were the giant tortoises were coming in. These are some rhinos. And so when you look at this landscape here during that time of about 10 to 20 million years ago, Florida was very much like North Africa and very temperate. It was, it was subtropical to temperate. And so it was a little bit warmer than it is today. A lot of people are worried about global warming. Uh, there were time periods in our Earth where it was normally 13 degrees warmer than it is today. So we, we have a little bit of way to go before we should over panic, but you know, we have to take care of the environment, that's for certain. Okay. Now, one of the important fossils that was found in the early 20th century was out in uh, called Seminole Field in Pinellas County. And this particular site uh, was found by a, a fellow uh, local collector, and there was a paleontologist living in uh, Treasure Island over in the west, on the west coast over in Pinellas County. It was from the American Museum of Natural History. And this collector took these fossils to uh, Walter Granger. He was a paleontologist. And it just happened his mother actually had a beach house over there in Pinellas County. And so he would identify fossils here in Florida for the locals. And he realized that this was a pretty much important site. And so there's a fellow called Gaylord Simpson, Simpson who was actually the paleontologist for the American Museum of Natural History. And he was an expert on early mammals. And they said, oh, this stuff looks just like the La Brea tar pit fossils from the Ice Age. And so they started doing a dig. And this is one of the early photographs. You can see their workers here. They were kind of like, uh, I would say, real volunteers. <laughs> they were kind of conscripted to dig holes out there during the 1920s. And they found literally thousands, thousands of fossil bones. Finally, in the 1970s, the site at Joe's Creek, and you could actually cross this creek in Pinellas County. It's very easy to find. It's all dug out now, so you're not really going to find fossils in it anymore. But it was such a famous site in the 1920s that it was considered the Eastern North America's La Brea Tar Pit. Very important site. And this is them digging in the 1970s. And this is Roy Chapman Andrews. Uh, and the guy on the left was Walter Granger. And these guys were famous here. And Walter, Walter Granger's grandmother lived here and mother in Florida. And Roy Chapman, he was the head of the Gobi Desert Expeditions. You ever heard of the Gobi Desert? Where the American Museum said, early man started out you know, in Asia. And so they wanted to send teams of scientists over there to Asia and find prehistoric man. And Louis B. Leakey, which we just talked about earlier, he was uh, in Africa and he believed, oh, prehistoric people started out in Africa. And the American Museum team said, nah, they started out you know, uh, elsewhere in China. And so Chapman actually put that, that, that expedition together in the 1920s. And the reason why uh, Chapman actually was able to do that is he actually worked for the uh, government in the World War I. And he actually had diplomatic attache credentials. And he actually worked, it wasn't called the CIA at that time in World War I, 
but they were a government agency that spied on countries. And he was sent over there and he had all the ins and outs to go into China. So that's how he got permission to, to do. So all of these, all these people that have been collecting here in Florida are somehow interconnected with one another around the country. And that, that's the uh, Gaylord Simpson. That's a little friend of his on his shoulder. <laughs> and that's what the site looked like. It was just a layers of stained soil with bone in it. And you can see how built up Pinellas County was in 1929. That's all houses here now, and malls and shopping centers. Back then it was just scrub, scrub pine and uh, citrus groves, that was it. Florida has changed dramatically in the last 50 years. And La Brea Tar Pits, this is what they compared it to. And you can see in this pit here from 1913 in California, the bones were starting to come out and they were pretty much the same age, about 20,000 years old to 15,000 years old. So it became a very important site here in Florida. And this is what La Brea Tar Pits look like today. Anybody been out there to California and see the La Brea? The museum's amazing, isn't it? The dire wolf wall where they have all the skulls, 2,500 dire wolf skulls. I'd like to have one. <laughs> I got jaws and partials, but not a whole one. Okay. And Thomas Farm, so by the 1930s, the collectors here in Florida were starting to work with the US Geological Survey and Dr. Gaylord Simpson. And so they started working on a site in Thomas Farm. A rancher found a bunch of bones there. And this is one of the earliest sites that we have here in Florida. It dates about 17 million years old. And the horses were only about this tall. So they were rather small horses. And uh, there was one horse that was real tiny, only about this tall, like almost like a big German shepherd. So the horses were much different about 17 million years ago. And I don't know if you're familiar with the horses here in Florida, but you know we have 17 species of prehistoric horses in Florida. There's just bunches of different fossil horses we find. And the fossil horses in the early days were just tiny little horses. And so this is one of the sites that verified that it was so early the horses were, you know, not, not even the size of a big pony. And then the bear dogs, and I mentioned bear dogs earlier, the carnivores, this thing was bigger than a bear. This thing was a monster carnivore, and you can see the skull of it here. And it was almost two thirds the length of this table, the skull. The thing was probably about 15 feet long, the bear. It was a gigantic bear, bear-like dog. <laughs> not a bear, not a dog. And these are some of the jaws and skull of the fossil horses that lived right alongside of it. So this told us now at this site that there were prehistoric animals that were living here at least about 17 million years ago and were considered what we call early Miocene period. So this was a very significant fossil site. One of the fossils that's been found up here in the rivers from this time period is this giant pig. It's called Diodon, and it was found by a friend of mine, Harry Miller and Phyllis Miller, uh, in the Suwannee River in the 1970s. And actually, Harry and Phyllis found the lower jaw of this giant pig. And they thought they had a mastodon jaw, an elephant jaw. And so they decided to take it to Gainesville at the University of Florida. And a friend of mine, Dr. Dave Webb, looked at it and says, oh my gosh, you got a giant pig jaw. So here's this pig that was the size of a mastodon. It was a gigantic pig. I always tell my kids, well, how much barbecue sauce is that gonna take? <laughs> <laughs> roast a giant pig. That'd be pretty. That would feed most everybody in Bartow, I would suppose. <laughs> so we, we actually have a skull and we have partial skeleton of this giant pig. But because uh, the University of Florida wanted it as a donation and the collector that found it kind of had a tiff with the University of Florida. So this specimen ended up in the uh, University of Kansas and they studied it. So it's just kind of one of those things how, you know, fossils are kind of territorial kind of thing with the collectors. 
And one of the most famous fossil collectors in the 1970s, because we're getting into the 19, this is where I came into fossil collecting in Florida. I don't go back into the 1880s, unfortunately, <laughs> but, but by the 1970s, and I always consider uh, Dr. Dave Webb was kind of like the founder. Uh, did you ever know Dave? Da Dave just passed away a couple years ago. He was the lead paleontologist for about uh, 40 years at the uh, University of Florida. And Dave actually created their, uh, their doctoral degree program for paleontologists at the University of Florida. And he, he put together, just think of this. When Dave came into University of Florida, we had approximately 20,000 fossils of Florida at that time in 1963. And when Dave retired in 2007, the museum had acquired over a half a million vertebrate fossils. Now, is that an accomplishment or what? And he actually had 39 doctoral candidates he graduated. So Dave, Dave had, and I was going to tell, who is the guy up here we were talking about, the Leakeys? Dr. Leakey from Africa, because he's the one that thought early man. And he was very famous, Dr. Leakey. Everybody know who he, Leakey is? Yeah, he's the one that came up with the idea. Early man started out in Africa. He trained Jane Goodall to go out and start looking at chimpanzees and study their behavior. And so Dave Webb, was, he was actually working on his doctorate at the University of California. And his professor said to Dave, Dave, Dr. Leakey's flying in from Africa and he's hosting an event for us at the University of California. And he said, I want you to go up to this site and it's a really famous site, it's called uh, Mount Diablo, California, where they find fossils. And it's just, bones are just sticking out of the clay everywhere, but it's really hard pan clay. And so uh, his professor said, Dave, I want you to go out there and take Dr. Leakey and show him this fossil site and show him how we collect vertebrate fossils. This is a personal story Dave told me about Leakey. And so he took Leakey out to this site, you know, they had to climb up the mountain to get to it. And so Dave gets his pickaxe out and he starts wailing at this hill and bone rocks flying and bones are flying and he picks up and he's so proud and he says, here, Dr. Leakey, here's how we find this saber cat jaw. Here's how we find this. And, and Leakey said, to him, is this how you handle your scientific control on excavating the site? Because <laughs> Leakey was like a little toothbrush and method methodically bring the boat out, you know, after two weeks. And Dave's wailing at these and <laughs> rocks are flying everywhere. And so Dave, we laughed like heck at it. <laughs> that was Dave's first experience with Dr. Leakey. <laughs> but you know, Leakey was, he was a pretty cool guy. <laughs> I only met, I only talked to me if I never got a chance. His uh, daughter-in-law I got to talk to. But Ben Waller is probably here in Florida, one of the most famous paleontologists. He's holding the jaws of a mastodon. Um, ben started scuba diving in the 1970s. Uh, I'm sorry, 1940s. He was a diver for the US Navy. And of course, after the war, he was able to keep his um, scuba gear equipment. And he was one of the first people in Florida that started diving the rivers and looking for things in the rivers with scuba gear. It was, a, it was like a brand new science, scuba diving, in the 1940s and 50s. And so uh, Ben would dive in the rivers and he would find thousands and thousands of fossils. And most of the archeologists and paleontologists never realized that the fossils here in Florida, our rivers are virtually scattered with fossil bone in the bottom of the rivers. And wherever you have a sinkhole and the river flows over a sinkhole and erodes it out, and those are actually animal traps and animal dens and their bones would get buried in those traps and then when the river washed them out, you could dive along the bottom and you'd find exposures of bones. Back in the 70s and 60s, you could go on the bottom of the rivers like the Santa Fe River and the, even the, with the Coochie up north of here and the Peace River, and you'd find huge elephant bones in the bottom of the river. In fact, one friend of mine uh, found so, saw so much elephant bone in the Santa Fe River in northern Florida that some of the divers actually, there was a, a dead palm tree that was laying on the bank. And the divers would put the leg bones on this palm tree and it looked like a picket fence. There were that, there were that many elephant bones. 
And they're still bringing up elephant bone out of the Peace River. A friend of mine, Bob, Dr. Bob, uh, he's actually got a mammoth he's uh, working on. He's got all of the skeleton except the skull. He's trying to, trying to find the skull. Good, well, that's, that'll be lucky. But Ben here, when he was working in the, in the Santa Fe River, he actually was finding some of the earliest fossil evidence of prehistoric people, artifacts and bones. And one of the things he found was a bone of a bird. And he didn't know it was a bird at the time. And he took it up to Gainesville and he showed it to him. And it was actually a, a, a bone of the ankle of a terror bird. It's one of these seven foot tall birds that had a head like an eagle and it could outrun horses and camels. And it was a migrant from South America and Antarctica. Can you imagine the range from Florida to South America to Antarctica? It's unbelievable. And it li lived during the end of the, at the late ice age, well, the early ice age, about two million years ago. And Ben found this bone. And this thing, the bone was pretty big for an ankle bone. And of course, they recognized it up in Gainesville that it was a prehistoric bird. And he became very famous for this bird fossil. And the bird is called Titanus walleri. And it's named after Ben. So a lot of the paleontologists, our amateurs, a lot of the fossils are named after the amateurs here in Florida. There's the bird, and it's mounted up in the University of Florida. Now, don't get it wrong. We don't, we don't have an actual skeleton of this bird. We have 80 bone, uh, no, 39 known bones, 41 known bones. Uh, two are not from Florida. 39 of them are from Florida. That's all we have of this bird, bits and pieces of it. Not a complete skull, just bits and pieces. And this is the case with Florida fossils. A lot of times the fossils we find here are partial skeletons, if you're lucky, or a single bone or tooth. Some of the fossils here in Florida are only recognized just even sometimes by one tooth. There's Dr. Dave Webb, and he's the one that put the program together. And Dave is famous for understanding, because of this bird, that animals during the rising of the Panama area as a land bridge that before that South America and North America were separate. Asia was separate from North America. And then over time, these continents would connect to one another as land bridges. And he came up with the idea that animals were actually migrating back and forth from continent to continent. And Dave was the one that came up with this concept. Very, very brilliant man, good friend. Very good friend. Okay. Another site here in northern Florida near Citrus County is called the Inglis site. And the reason why I wanted to highlight this site is that it has some really rare saber tooth cat fossils that were found in it in the 1960s. And it was found by amateur paleontologists. And what they were doing is they were building the intercoastal bridge that was across the, the canal, the interstate canal in the 1960s. They had this really brilliant idea uh, that the USGS, they wanted to build a canal across Florida so that they could have shipping, which is kind of obsolete now, but go across the state instead of all the way around Key West. So they came up, and then all of a sudden, the environmentalist says, Oi, hey, are you kidding me? You're going to change the groundwater table and the biomass of Florida, you know, which is kind of a valid point. And so they kind of scrapped it. So you can still see the beginning of the canal up there in Inglis. And they found all these really rare fossils there, like the giant glyptodont, which is like an armadillo that was built like a tank, and actually a, um, what do you call it, a hyena. Only North American hyena is found here. That's what it looked like. And the rhinoceroses, this came out of Love, Love Bone Bed. And this is a site I actually worked on for a number of years. Uh, University of Florida found this site near Archer. Anybody know where Archer's at? If you go out of Gainesville off of 75, drive uh, westward towards Cedar Key, you hit this little town of Archer, nice little town. And they found this fossil site in an okra field. The rancher was actually plowing his okra field, and he found rhino bones in the field. So he took them up to Dave, and Dave said, uh, you know, you might really have an important site here. So they dug there in the 1970s, and they found this new cat called Barbophilus lavorum. So 
the, the family that owned the ochre field were the Love family. And because they named it after the wife and the husband, when it's named after two people, it goes O-R-U-M. So when you see those letters after the name, it means two people. It was named after two individuals. Let's see what else we got here. The Love Cats. And so in the 1980s, or 83, 84, 85, I was able to dig there. University of Florida said, well, we're done with the site, Dave. Go dig, see what you find. I found dozens of saber-toothed cat fossils and ended up showing them everything I had. Uh, mines were pretty much duplicates of what they had, so I got to keep it. So I have it in my collection. And another site that I kind of worked on in the 70s when I first came here was this Kellogg Phil. This is the ankle bone of a little three-toed horse that a friend of mine found, and it came out of Pinellas County. And these are rare. There's only two examples. I have them, one in my collection, and there's one in Gainesville, and it is on display in Gainesville. But this little horse is uh, 28 million years old. It was one of the first horses that, that, that lived in Florida when it was partially islands here. And it was only about the size of a fox terrier. It was a very small, very small horse. And we only have a, a couple of ankle bones of this, this horse. But Florida is horse heaven. Did you know that? We don't know. It's the grasslands here in Florida and the minerals because of the soil and the mineral content. And horses thrive like nowhere else in the world. Uh, the best race horses in the world are not Kentucky, all they would like to be. <laughs> but most of the famous horses have been coming out of Ocala area because it's just the right habitat. And when you dig in the sites around Ocala, full of fossil horses, they just were very common. Tapers, they're related to horses, and we find them here. They had a little proboscis in the front of their nose, and they're like the Asian tapers. We had mastodons, these prehistoric hairy elephants here, right in central Florida. And I'll be doing a lecture in Purdue University in October, so you're up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, <laughs> I don't think you'll be up there, but bison, and these are, these are great indicators for late ice age fossils, the bison, and everybody loves the saber-toothed cats. So Florida has quite a number of saber-toothed cats. The big ones are pretty rare. Uh, in fact, uh, this rarest cat we have here in Florida is, was found in Hale 21A by a couple of friends of mine in 1981-82. And this cat was a large, what was called a skimeter, skimeter tooth cat. And in the Hale Quarry, which is a mining company in Hale, Florida, uh, a friend of mine found a sinkhole and it was covered with pig bones. And when he found these pig jaws, he thought a rancher was butchering pigs and just throw these bones into the pit and they were just using it as a trash dump. And so he took the jaw to a, another friend of mine that was working on a love site just before I was, and showed him these jaws, and those guys said, hmm, that looks like an Ice Age pig. And so the two of them that were at love, they decided to go and find this site that Eric found, and they found the site, and they started digging jaws up. And they, you could go on a weekend, and you could collect four or five pig jaws from this Ice Age pig. And back then, they were selling the things for like three, $400 each. So, you know, that was a pretty good profit per day. I'm not into selling fossils, but uh, th those guys were doing it. And so the fellow by the name of Larry Martin, who was a collector in, in uh, Ocal uh, uh, or Orlando, he said, well, I'd like to dig that site with you guys. And they said, okay, come along. And they said, but you can't dig in our little spot, you know, where we're at in the pit. Find another spot over there somewhere. So he started digging, and in two hours, he found these two cats, <laughs> two saber-toothed cats. <laughs> and he, he finally ended up, he sold the one, he gave one to the University of Florida. So it is, a, it is the skull you see here on the left, is in Gainesville. And then the cat, uh, the other cat that was almost complete, he sold it for 39000 to the, one of the guys that he was collecting with. And then he sold it to a fellow by the name of John Barbieres. And John's a famous fossil collector out in Mesa, Arizona, and he, he bought it for an undisclosed amount. 
<laughs> quite significantly more than what <laughs> the other guy got. So uh, they did a paper on it and they found out this cat totally completely different than the cats that we normally find in Florida. And it's almost identical to the Smilodon from La Brea Tar Pits, but the sabers are real thin, so it's what's called a skimmer juice cat. So Dr. Larry Martin, who actually found this site, uh, identified this cat, realized that it was a, a, a completely new cat to science. So we're gonna go through this a little bit. Here's Frank Garcia, and he's famous for the Lysi Shell Pit uh, over in Ruskin, very famous site. He found, uh, it's, it's early Irvingtonian, so it's about two million years old, and he found it in uh, 1983, and there's a story on that. If you wanna know what it is, I'll tell you after the program. But he found, they found these saber cat skulls. He found a mammoth tooth that was 30 inches long. So we don't, we're, we're not even sure how big that mammoth was. It must have been 14, 15 feet tall at the shoulder. A very significant, important early ice age site here in Florida. That's Frank there to the left. There's a cat skull of the Smilodon, which is the same cat cast of that skull there. We think that these things were crossing rivers and crocodiles were grabbing them and pulling them under. We have leg bones with bite marks from the crocodiles and alligators. So these cats were crossing the rivers to follow game and gators would get them. They'd get the other animals too. <clears throat> and one of the uh, recent sites that was found in the 1980s was Moss Acre site. And this is one of the few sites I told you how horses, <laughs> that's a racetrack for the, one of the ranchers <laughs> raising racehorses, you know, you know, little races. And here's the site, and they found all these fossil rhino bones and elephant bones. And it's very unusual for Florida because this site was producing partial skeletons, like a whole leg with the bones together, or a whole backbone, or a whole neck and skull. So this was what, like one of the most significant sites. And it actually pieced in together the age of about five to seven million years ago here in Florida. So now we kind of know what some of these late uh, Miocene sites were like here in Florida. Very, very important site. Uh, they found this giant river otter. It was pretty close to the size of a black bear. You can imagine an otter that was that big, very large, and a lot of bone-eating dog bones. So it was a little bit different. Bone eat, do you know dogs eat bones? <laughs> The, this thing had teeth, these dogs had teeth like hyenas. And so they kind of got that name, bone-eating dog. <clears throat> Crazy stuff. And that was about 27 million years ago. This site, called I-75 site, is about the oldest fossils we have here from vertebrate animals here in Florida. Uh, it's, it was found right on I-75 on the first exit when you cross past the the rest stops there in Gainesville. And uh, it was a geology student from University of Florida. <clears throat> he got so excited about fossils of Florida, he decided to just look along the road cut there where they were doing the ramp off when they were making I-75. And he found this site that was 27 million years old. And it's as old as some of the early and late Oligocene fossils, which are some of the earliest mammal fossils you find in Nebraska. So very, very unusual. And this horse came into my office in 1997, and a fellow by the name of Chris Skillman found this horse, three-toed horse, and it was so tiny, I said to Chris when he brought it into my office, this skull, I said, well, where'd you find that out in Nebraska? And he said, no, I found it in Curlew Creek in Pinellas County, in Clearwater. I said, nah, get out of here, there's no way you found that. He said, I'll show you. So he took me to the site, and here in the water was this horse. The skeleton was pretty much all there. In fact, half of the horse is still there. We've never been able to remove the entire horse. And it ended up, it's early 27th. And I kept saying with Dr. Uh, Bruce McFadden, who's a world-leading horse expert, I said, well, I, I, he said, I think it's a myohippus. And I said, well, you know, it could be an archaeohippus. And then a fellow in the graduate student was saying to me, I came up into the lab there in Gainesville, and he said, Dave, what would be a good graduation paper for me to write for my dissertation? And I said, well, you need to work on Chris Skillman's horse because it's new to science. 
I said, talk to Dave Webb, he'll tell you all about it. And he wrote a paper on it, and can't brag, but it was an archaeohypnist. <laughs> I, got, I got lucky on that one. There's Bruce, world-leading expert on horses with archaeohypnists. I just saw him a month ago, gave us a tour of the new exhibit. If you ever get a chance, go up there to Gainesville. They got a great exhibit, Horse, what the horses were like back then. They were a little, pretty sleek, thin horses. Then I was involved in this site. This was uh, the Millennium Park bone bed. And I got a call in my office in the 1990, about 19, no, 2007, 2006. And this little girl in Pinellas County was walking the creek in Millennium Park there in Pinellas, not far from Eckerd College. And she found a mammoth tooth. And so the park rangers called us up and they said, do you have anybody up in Mosey that could identify fossils? And so my friend of mine that was an archaeologist next to me said, Dave, I don't know anything about fossil bones. They found a mammoth. They think they found a mammoth tooth in Pinellas. And I said, can, can you get out of your office? And I said, told my director, I said, I'll be gone. <laughs> and so we went over there and looked at these bones. And uh, I said, well, have the bones ready for us, you know. So I expected, a, you know, a couple of bones. And so I go into their work sheds at the park and all the doors are open and all their equipment, all their riding lawnmowers or tractors, everything's outside. And I'm like, what the heck? And they took me in there and the entire sheds, which was almost as big as half of this room, were covered with bones from one end to the other. And I looked at it and I said, you got a bone bed. This is really an important site. And then I started finding bison and that made it even more important because it's late ice age. And we don't have many late ice age sites here in Florida. Vero, Seminole Field, and there's a Lacanto, there's a sinkhole. There, we don't have a lot of it. So that was an extremely important site. And I was actually wrote a preliminary paper on it. And we identified it as a late ice age site. Had these beautiful mammoth jaws like that. And that's, just, that's little Sierra Sardi. She's a little girl, 16 year old girl that found this site. Kids, you know, kids, they're really good at finding things. We found like ground sloths. We found uh, bones and horse teeth. That's what the, the bones looked like when they was coming out of the site. So far, the University of Florida has gathered 200,000 specimens from that site, 200,000. And how, what did I say when Webb retired? Is it time? Okay, I'm gonna go through this real quick. Glyptodon, giant bison, tibia, and we have ice age fossils of prehistoric people. There's our artifacts we find through this area, like the Simpson points. Mount Brook is the big site that's going on right now. Get up to Gainesville, the lab, they have a new fossil lab on exhibit there, and they're actually showing you the preparations of the fossils from Mount Brook. So it's a five million year old site, and we have a lot of new specimens of new animals from this site, a new saber-toothed cat like this cat here. And with that, I am going to call it a day. Not exactly, we're gonna say thank you first. <laughs>
I have no paperwork on it, and I have no idea what it is. Well, this is, this is the cast of the skull. Uh, this particular cast was casted as a reconstruction by the University of Florida, and I would say it was probably in the 1990s. Uh, Frank Garcia, the guy I told you earlier, Frank's very well known here in Florida. He's in South Dakota now. He started a museum in uh, Hot Springs. And he found this on a little island in, a, in the phosphate mines uh, that he had to use a canoe to get to it. And Frank broke his uh, foot, his leg. And, and he actually would, stop, would not stop fossil collecting. And so he actually got a little canoe and he propelled himself out to this little island and he said that he found this skull on that little island. And I believe it was near, um, near, Fort, near um, Four Corners area. Okay. And, and we believe it's um, more like a, the earlier deposits in Bone Valley. And it's, it is called Kyptosaurus amatorum, which means strange horned beast and, for, and named after the amateurs in Florida, amatorum. And Frank, Frank, because he was an amateur, uh, that's what they named it. Now, the actual skull itself was the, the jaw sections with the teeth he found, the front horn and the rear horns. So the rest of the skull is actually reconstructed based on what these animals were like out west. There were actually some of these animals uh, that lived out west that are similar to it, but this one is considered more recent than the ones from out west. But that's what you have. That, and actually, I don't think there's a lot of these skulls were made, cast of them. So this is really, it's hard to get a whole, I'd love to have one of those in my collection, just the cast. But that's a really fine specimen. Well, thank you. See, it's thank so great you. that you visited with us today. <laughs> I know we have some questions from the audience. Any comments, questions, stories? Treasures uh, you want to share? Boy, I must have said it all. <laughs> Everything was said. Thank you so much for being with us. Now, here's what I've discovered, is that sometimes we're shy to ask questions when we have two cameras rolling. So our expert's gonna be around for a while, so come up and enjoy him, have some conversation, and take a look at all our treasures. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. For more information, go to polk-county.net.